UCC is filled with incredible people, creative, committed, loving, and inspiring folks who give of themselves in beautiful and generous ways. We came early. <laughs> Over the years, we have had several folks who have shared their gifts with us, oftentimes in the form of books that they have written as they relate to faith, often their own faith journeys, reminding us that even as we are all on different paths, we have several points of intersection. Our own Vivian Johnson has taken to the pulpit after she wrote, first, love in the time of crisis and then the willow tree and me and next month the reverend dr terry lepage will be with us as we reflect upon the climate crisis and she shares her pastoral heart with us following the release of her new book eye of the storm but today the reverend bill allenbach joins us as we explore his journey as he shares it within his new book how to make love with Jesus, the agape kind. Happy Father Eros. Bill, <laughs> Father Bill, who is as unique as the spelling of his name, one L was spelled wrong up there, B-I-L. He can tell us about that sometime. <laughs> was born a PK, a preacher's kid, and he grew up in Philadelphia, graduated from Kenyon College in Ohio, when he graduated from college, the U.S. found itself in the Korean conflict, and so he became an amphibious tank officer in the Marine Corps, but he decided in 1957 that he would rather love people than kill them. So he went to seminary in Berkeley and then returned to Hawaii in 1960 as the minister of youth for a large suburban parish. He met his beautiful wife, Anne, and right just hours after she'd arrived in Honolulu as the new kindergarten teacher at the church's parochial school, and a mere six weeks later, he asked her to marry him. 62 years ago. They have three grown daughters. They moved to California in 75 to seek better educational opportunities for their middle daughter. And as Bill tells it, the Bishop of Los Angeles wasn't interested in him. So he became an assist, ass, assistant city manager in La Mirada and did church fill-in type work on the weekends. Three years later, he started People Helpers Incorporated, which provided human, recreational, and child care services to the public and private entities in Southern California. He started counseling services, and then he and Annie retired in 2002, and they showed up at IUCC in 2008 thanks to his friendship with the Reverend Fred Plummer our pastor emeritus. Bill says the short version of all of that should go something like this. Here's Bill. A living 21st century heretic in exile <laughs> who can't wait to share his heresies. So if you want to know more about him and his newest book, you can go to his webpage. You can pick up the book over here. His webpage is peace lovejoyhope.com and you can peruse his blogs and you can also see some of Annie's art. So he is here and we're going to have a conversation. We're a progressive church, progressive Christian community, and that has several implications. We're socially inclusive, hence our unwavering commitment to the LGBTQ community. We seek justice, which means often we're standing alongside and advocating for workers as we seek economic justice, or we're working for climate justice, or we're exploring our own biases as we work towards racial justice, and we're doing our best to fight against all of the injustices because we share the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King's belief that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. But being progressive Christians isn't just about social justice. It has theological implications. After Fred Plummer retired from IUCC, he spent the next 20 years as the head of the Center for Progressive Christianity, now simply called progressivechristianity.org, which invites us to ground our theology, oftentimes aided by history and scholarship, to help us understand why we do this justice work. 
and what it means to be connected to one another along our paths. So my first question for you is maybe simple. <laughs> As a progressive Christian church, I know that's why you came to us and found a home after many, many years as an Episcopal priest. Talk to us about what this means to you. Come on, Gavin. Well, I, I, I'm going to make this short because I could go on for a long time. I, I, I write article, PC at IUCC, in which I've expressed my own interpretation of progressive Christianity. But, but let me try this one on you. Progressive Christianity to me is when you can walk into a church and they don't tell you, please leave your brains at the door. We're going to tell you what to think and believe and vote and all the rest of it. A progressive church is one where you walk in the door and they say, bring your critical thinking inside. Bring your questions, your doubts. Let us help you formulate a theology that will work in your daily life. That's the short version. Read my book for the longer version. <laughs> <laughs> so what was the impetus for writing this book? COVID. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. It was March 10th, 2020, and Annie and I started sort of seeing, hmm, this isn't going to be anything very short, so we quarantined ourselves. You know, there's nothing like being quarantined with your best friend. <laughs> uh, and so that wasn't an issue at all, but uh, then after a couple weeks, a couple months, I said, I just can't keep pestering her all day long. I've got to do something. So I decided to write two books. One is The Love Story of Anne and Bill, uh, which is sort of some memoirs. We've had a, a very adventuresome, exciting life. And the, the second one was this book that I wrote in 2008. It had the catchy title of What's Love Got to Do With It? I kind of stole it from Tina Turner's song. <laughs> I was really hoping she'd sue me and then everybody would want to buy my book. <laughs> it didn't work out that way. <laughs> and uh, it has a subtitle of Everything Says Jesus. But um, so I started to rewrite it. What happened was I gave it to an editor instead of my editor, Sharon Gold, because this guy was just gushing all over the book. He could do all kinds of things with it, and I believed him. Well, he returned the book, and it really wasn't very well edited, but I published it. But I was kind of, and yeah, I've written a book, uh, but I, I wasn't very proud of it. I later found out he was going through a divorce and moving partway across the country while he was editing my book. So I said, I need to rewrite that, because the messenger stunk. The message is fantastic. So I then started rewriting it, and it, I showed it to my editor, Sharon Goldinger. Again, she works with some of us here in the congregation, and she said, it's your best book. <laughs> I'm the kind of guy blowing my ear, and I'll follow you anywhere. But, uh, <laughs> so she said, give it to me, so I gave her 370 pages, and she took it down to really the 80 pages it is now, and the 40 pages of the workbook. And so... My impetus was uh, COVID, thank you very much. <laughs> so, after reading this book, I can see how your own theological and Christological beliefs have really changed over the years. And also the real frustration you've had with the institution. Rather than being a book about the historical Jesus, which there are many, or even about the church, which there are many more, this shares the unfolding of your journey, and I think that means that it's written for people who are kind of fed up with traditional Christianity as it's interpreted with what we call a soteriological Jesus, using our theological terms, which means a Jesus who died to save us, and that atonement theology that assumes that is in Jesus' death that we are then atoned ourselves or redeemed of these very sins. It's a very conversational book. I feel like I'm in conversation with you as I'm reading it. It's a bit pithy at times as you dismiss this stuff of Christianity that doesn't work for you anymore, and I suspect may not work for many of us anymore. You've grown past an understanding of God that is theistic, which I mean in terms of a God that looks like a human or what
what we might imagine looks like Zeus would have looked like, or Dumbledore, <laughs> or Gandalf, Doc, sorry. And that, that old man with the beard in the sky kind of look. And you grew into using terms like creation, which I find that interesting because rather than using creator, which we often use in our, at least in our version of the Lord's Prayer, we also often assume that creation is the result of the creator. And you've also used a term that you've taken from a poem, which you've shared before, and I think you have it in the beginning of the book, called No One Up There. And you use it almost as though it's a name in itself. So we know that we certainly have some atheists among us here, but my question for you is, do you identify as an atheist now? If so, how does that fit into your faith? And if not, perhaps explain to us what you now consider and understand God to be, if not a man upstairs, no one up there. Would you repeat the question? <laughs> I'm just fussing with you a little bit. As Do Pastor you or Sarah don't you? <laughs> was nice enough to send me the question, and I really saw about six sermons in there, but I'm not getting given it to you all right now. But I saw some questions that I, I just would like to touch on. The, the first one is the traditional church. I, I like tradition, but I don't want to be holden to tradition. The Episcopal Church is. It's very much a part of their root. So um, I really see in the Episcopal Church, we, we've fallen in love, instead of with Jesus and agape, we've fallen in love with the liturgy, and we do all this fancy stuff. That gets in the way of the message of Jesus for me. So if I have a choice, I'll take change. I love change. I think change is refreshing. So give me change, and I'll put tradition on the back burners. And then you really hit me with the doctrine of the atonement. If there's any doctrine I really don't like, it's the doctrine of the atonement. I don't like it for any reasons, never will, never can, never could. Uh, to me, uh, I think it, it when, when the concept of Jesus dying for my sins. Now, now picture this, picture this, this loving God we have. He loves us, he accepts us, he, he, he's, he just can't give us enough love. And all of a sudden he designs a plan to have his son killed in the most torturous fashion there ever could be. That does not work for me at all, that because uh, I do not believe that that was the plan. I believe that was Paul's plan. And again, I'm not a big pan, fan of Paul, but what Paul did in his Judaism was take the sacrificial ram uh, of Passover and he replaced it with Jesus. So Jesus then, oh yeah, and that's right, Jesus was crucified, so let's do that. So instead of the sacrificial lamb, we have Jesus being sacrificed. I don't think that's the way it happened. Having been in a church, and as, as Pastor Sarah suggested, some bishops don't want me, and I understand that, but I, <laughs> I also know that the hierarchy of the church can be pretty mean, and there's no question in mind that the high priests of Judaism, uh, the Caiaphases and the family in that, got real tired of this pesky little Jewish kid down in Galilee, or I should say up in Galilee, calling him names all the time. Have you ever read the 23rd chapter of Matthew? Woe to you, O Pharisees and scribes. I always like the one uh, that says, you're like whitewashed tombs pure and driven and clean on the outside, rotten and decaying on the inside. Bishops don't like to have you say that, neither do <laughs> high priests. So, you know, that's the reason he was killed. I think people have used it as cheap grace. Uh, I have fraternity brothers who every Friday afternoon would go into confession. I say, what do you do that for? He said, well, we want to clean the slate so we can start all over tonight. And I, <laughs> Why does that work? It works for them, but it doesn't work for me. So I think what our real doctrine is, is the doctrine of unconditional love, agape. And, and Paul was able to divert the church because 
you can make a lot more money making people feel guilty than you can teaching them how to love. So uh, I think that is the thrust of that. Okay, you, you talk about my getting God in creation. I'm going to give you a, a real long, shaggy dog story. I love to tell it, uh, but you can read about it in the book or come to my class. But it, the short version is, on a Friday afternoon in 1958, my friend Brad and I, Brad, uh, he was a former Marine also. We were both preacher's kids, ended up in seminary, best friends. We both got on our motorcycles and were driving to an appointment when a fire engine came along and, and whacked us both, broadsided us. He was killed instantly. Now, that's not the story. That, that's just the lead into the story. The story really is takes place the next day. Here I am laying in bed with a cast on this can, a cask on that hand, cracked ribs in here, on painkillers, getting out of the anesthesia, right leg in a sling, uh, just mashed to little pieces. And in comes this priest and says, what did you and Brad do to deserve that? I'm going, what did you just say to me? Well, boy, that snapped me out of any fog I was in. I just said, Charlie, get out of here and never come back again. And I talked to the dean and I said, is Charlie right? I need to drop out of seminary if that's what we're really believing. He said, nah, Charlie's tenured, can't get rid of him. And, he, <laughs> and so he said, but that's, that's not the way it works. And so, but then I was really caught in a dilemma. My dilemma was, who is God? Because I'll have to admit, the church kind of gives me that God. Uh, that, and we, well, I'll talk about it in a minute. Anyway, I was wrestling with it, and we were working on the book of Romans. We were reading it in Greek. It took us a whole semester to read the first three chapters in Greek. It's a very complicated book. But anyway, in the first chapter, and I think it's the 21st verse, Paul talks about creator. Now, oops, creator, I'm having trouble with the anthropomorphic part of that, the human part of that. But all of a sudden, this concept of creation comes into my mind. Ah, yeah, that's it. it. We're about creation, you know. That's going to be my God. It has no gender. It's not sitting up there sending fire engines at people. It, it, it's not making judgments. It's not doing the things that this, this other God did. And so I hung on to creation, and it's worked for me very, very well. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was having lunch with Don Manziel, a member of the congregation. He said, you know, Bill, with creation, there's a creator. And I said, yeah. And he said, well, who, do you believe in a creator? And I said, I haven't gotten that far yet. But uh, <laughs> so yeah, I do not want to get hung up on whether God is creation, creator. I want to get to Jesus' message. So, you know, again, that was that was that taken care of pretty quickly. Uh, so that's what I did with the Doctrine of Atonement. And I have a hard time with seeing God, and again, the church does this, as some rich white guy who lives above the third filament of the flat earth, and he's up there pulling <laughs> puppet strings. I, I just can't buy that. I really can't. He killed my friend Brad. I don't want him. I'm not the least bit interested. But I am interested in this concept of agape and creation, our responsibility to love every growing thing spun, and I think it's uh, Paul Tillich, a, a famous 19th, 20th century theologian, who called it the ground of all being. I think we're talking about semantics at that particular stage. But the semantics are, it's much bigger than that God up there. So that's how God to be, got to be creation. Am I an atheist? Uh, well, how do you spell it? If it's uh, the, the small, usual spelling, no, I'm not an atheist. I have a very definite uh, divine creation in, in my existence. But if you spell it capital A, with a hyphen and then theist or theism. I am against that God up there because the church keeps telling us that's who our God is, that's who we have to worship. And I, I keep trying to say that, that there's much better than that. Let's try this concept of agape. So that's how I got to answer all your <laughs> questions. Well, 
I was just kind of setting you up to read the book and hear your. Oh, no, your, you uh, are. We're not anti finished. Anti Come to that class. There. I'm just wetting your appetite. Come on to that class. So, um, Craig actually identified the different types of love for us in Fresh Word, but why don't we just get right to it? Why do you think that that is the central focus of Jesus' ministry, and why is it at the heart of progressive Christianity? Well, I'm going to give you a fast answer. The quickest answer is it's unconditional love. Unconditional. No conditions. I'm sorry. We have to love pedophiles. We have to love mass murderers. Uh, they are fellow human beings. They've gotten off the path. But Jesus loved them. He, he loved these kinds of people. Didn't he lead the way? We have to love these kinds of people. So I believe in love, unconditional love. And little Billy has to put his prejudices, his pride, his, his garbage, his judgments, I have to put them all away if I'm to be a real follower of Jesus. So I put them away. And then the next thing it tells me is I have to forgive. Yeah, forgiveness is the greatest tool the church has. Yeah, I love the saying that says not forgiving someone is like drinking poison and waiting for them to die. Guess what? Who's going to die first? And, and as a psychotherapist, I'll tell you who's going to die first. And the third thing is agape love is just full of caring. That's our job, our responsibility, to care about the hurting world, the, the atmosphere, the environment. So that's my answer to agape. We'll talk about, if you need to talk about eros in my class, come on, and we'll talk about eros, storge, and philia. So, you know, after thinking about God, the nature of God, and, and I know you're not a big Paul fan, but um, I read a lot of First Corinthians 13 because I do weddings all the time, and so I meditate on this scripture saying it over and over and over again, and I, I just think that the qualities of love are renewing, transformative, powerful, and eternal. So do you think that God could be as simple as agape? Well, the, the way I really say it, I, I'm going to hang with uh, uh, creation. but And then creation has to have some foundation stones. And the foundation, probably the strongest foundation stone for me in creation is agape, love. That's, that's what I build. I have to love creation. I have to love my fellow human beings. I worked in jails and prisons for seven years. I work with the homeless. I've worked with gangs. I'm working with some real neat human beings in life. And I think, I, I really feel that that's, those are my marching orders. I have this wonderful opportunity every day. When I wake up, I know exactly what I have to do that day. I don't have to think about it. I don't have to go to the Bible. I don't have to listen to the radio or television. I have to agape all day long. And is it easy? No, it's not easy. Do I fail at it miserably at times? Uh, but forgiveness is another part of this whole agape love. So uh, it, it just, to me, is, is the cornerstone of my life and being. And I've, I've loved my life because this is how I'm to lead it. Well, last question, you talk about your hope for the church, for the future of the church, and your fears for what will happen if the progressive church doesn't make it and the more literal, Jesus dying for our sins, ticket to heaven, threats of hell, type of Christianity wins out. Since for you and for us as progressive Christians, resurrection is a powerful metaphor, do you think the church will resurrect? The church. Um, there are 11,000 different forms of Christianity in America, so when you say the church, I'm wondering which one you're talking about. But let, let me just say this. I think we're going through a reformation. It's a very quiet reformation. It's a different reformation. And this reformation is doing a couple things. A lot of us don't know, maybe we're aware of it, but in 2019 was the last time we really had a genuine statistic. Over 4,500 Christian churches closed down. They think it was over 4,000 in 2020. We're not sure about 2021. They are closing down left and right. Uh, we see churches that reform. I think the church next to us has changed its name four times. It's a new church with new ideas at this stage. So 
I think if we're aware that it's a reformation, and if we're aware th that we have to change, uh, I think the church is going to live. I think it's going to take a very different structure than we've had. I think it's going to take a different mission statement than maybe a lot of churches have. But I, I think if, if a church is built on agape love and built on serving our fellow human beings, it has a great chance in the future. The church that lives for itself is going to die for itself as we see thousands of churches closing down. So yes, I feel, and the book deals with the future church, I feel I'm in a church that has a great future, and uh, I, I want to be part of that future, so that's why I keep hanging around. Well, the last portion of the book is the workbook, which people can do on their own as a way to take stock of where you are on the journey, to articulate our own theology, which you're also going to begin a four-week series, a four-part series, which begins this evening, on this Wednesday evening, and then Thursday morning. Your book is really conversational. I feel like I'm in conversation with him, so you can do that personally. But if you want to be in actual conversation with Bill, you can sign up and join him Wednesday evening, Thursday morning. You can do so by Zoom also Zoom, yeah. if you can't come in person or if you're watching online from elsewhere. And um, we hope that you will. We join in conversation. That is what it is to be in community. So thank you, Bill. Thank well, you for thank joining you very us much this for morning. This opportunity of listening to a heretic. <laughs> thank you.